Albert Breer, senior NFL reporter, and uh, he uh, is the lead content strategist. Whoa, look at that business card for the MMQB. He joins us on the program. Albert, uh, thank you. Thanks for joining us here. What did the NFL learn or is trying to learn from what happened with the Marlins yesterday? I think more than anything else, Dan, it's going to be what they learn coming out of this. Um, you know, the expectation for the league was there's going to be a lot of positive tests and there were going to be some opt-outs coming into camp, but we've already seen that. You know, I think really the challenge begins now. And so what they're looking to learn from the other leagues is when one of these sorts of things happens, what happens after that? And so really as much of a shock as it was to the sports world to see the positive test with the Marlins, I think what the NFL is going to be studying more so isn't how it happened. It's going to be more how they react, how they're able to contain it in the aftermath. And I think there's going to be a lot to be learned because baseball does have two key similarities to football. Number one, they're starting a season. They're not finishing it like basketball and hockey. And number two, they're not in a bubble. Yeah, I'm trying to figure this out as we move forward and be optimistic. I saw Jason Lockenfor from CBS Sports who was quoting some front office executives saying, you know, it's not a question of uh, if, but when, uh, you know, this gets shut down or th- are we going to have an eight game schedule? Are we going to have 10, 12 games? There's no way we're going to have a full season here. These are people in the business who are, right. who are having these doubts. But the NFL home office has been a, quite a, kind of quiet on what the protocol is going to be. Peter King had the, uh, you know, the, the Minnesota Vikings story about everything they're going through. What is the league's approach here of saying, let's be quiet on all of this and just kind of plow forward? I mean, I'll give you a story from it was about three, four weeks ago. You know, this is somebody pretty high up at the league office you know, basically said, I'm, I'm not sure we've done a, enough to message this. And because they plowed forward, like you said, and kind of been business as usual, and because it worked for free agency and the draft, maybe it gave them a little bit of a false sense of security. You know, really, I, I think there was this concern within the league office that they hadn't messaged enough that there are going to be problems. And so when we do see Dante Hightower opting out, when we do see a list of 12 or 18 rookies every day coming out, with positive COVID tests, it's a little bit of a shock to the system. And I know there were some people in the league office who felt like they should have done a better job messaging that and getting it out. Like we're expecting this. This is part of the deal and playing in 2020. And so I think that's a big part of it. As for the team at, at the team level, I think one of the things that they're looking for from the league office right now is some more clarity of what happens post outbreak. And one of the key questions I got, and I think this is a really interesting one, Dan, from some teams yesterday, They still haven't set a number as far as what constitutes an outbreak and what it would take to shut a team down for a week, what it would take to cause a forfeiture. That's something I think a lot of teams are still looking for the answer to. Is it 15? Is it 20? Like how many cases inside a building will it take for the league to make a phone call and say, you guys got to shut it down? These are some of the things that the league still hasn't really clarified to its teams when it comes to you know, how things are going to play out over the next few weeks. And of course, more importantly, once we get into the season, I was wondering about this. We're talking Albert Breer of uh, the MMQB.com. And we were talking about this prior to the start of the show. Baseball has done this, this regionalized scheduling. Do you think that the NFL has given thought to, let's say the Patriots, the Jets, the Giants, and who else you want to throw in there on the East coast? <laughs> Uh, Eagles, Buffalo, Ravens, yeah. Buffalo Bills are in there. Uh, Florida, you have the Florida teams, so they're they're able to play each other twice. So those are that's eight games you have of the of, of the season, you know. Um, but I I know it throws the schedule off, and we love marquee yeah. matchups, but I don't know if that's a have you thought about it last ditch that we keep down our our travel down, and you yeah. know the home and away is not very far uh, either home or away. Well, they had discussed, Dan, and this is in the spring, in, the, in April and May, the idea of bubble concept. And, and I don't think it would work in the NFL to have one big bubble. It's just too many people. And so one of the things that I know had sort of been tossed around was like almost like a pod format, like Olympic style group play. Yeah. Um, and that was something that was shot down pretty quickly and never advanced very far for two reasons. Number one, Dr. Alan Sills, the league's chief medical officer, didn't think it was a good idea. And number two, the players were wholeheartedly against it. And so that never really got off the ground. I think logistically with football, and you know this, like the amount of players that are shuttled on and off rosters because of the injury rate in the NFL would make containing a bubble 
really, really, really logistically different, difficult. And so and you go back to April and May, and this was something that was discussed, but it never really got off the ground because there were some key figures that were really, really against the idea. I know we love to give grades. Somebody has to win. Somebody has to lose. If it's a draft pick, you had the trade with Jamal Adams, you know, the Jets sending him for a couple of first round draft picks. Uh, what's your sense with people you've spoken to on, I, I like what Seattle did. It's, you know, the NFL is about now, you know, winning yeah. now. And you have this opportunity with Russell Wilson. The Jets aren't winning now, but uh, if you're giving out grades or who won, who lost, uh, where do you stand with this? I mean, I, like, I hate to cut, like, it sounds like a cop out saying win-win, but I mean, there are two teams in very, two very different situations. I mean, I think Joe Douglas, when he was hired about a year ago, came to the realization they were a few drafts away from really contending. Um, and it was a pretty massive rebuild he was going to go through. And if this player's made it clear to you, if Jamal Adams has made it clear to you, he's not signing a long-term deal. You have to ask yourself the question, when I get good, is he even going to be here anymore? And so I think that that was part of the equation for the Jets. They weren't going to give him away, you know, but you know, you do want to get the proper return for him. And I think they were comfortable going forward with him. Really, this has been discussed between the Seahawks and the Jets for about a month and a half, and the parameters were in place, I'd say, about a week ago. And really, for the Seahawks to be comfortable with it, they wanted to see the rules. So for the Jets, this is about restocking the cupboard and building going forward. For the Seahawks, look, the last piece to rebuilding a secondary that once had Cam Chancellor, Earl Thomas, and Richard Sherman, they got a lot of young players they like there. He's an alpha. He's a fit for Pete Carroll's program. And really, right now, they feel like they're close enough. And they view these draft picks as chips. And they didn't think they'd have a chance to get a player like a Jamal Adams in the draft because of where they're drafting every year. And so is it a calculated risk? Sure it is. But John Schneider's never, never had a problem taking those. Some of them have worked out. Dwayne Brown's an example of that. Some of them haven't. Percy Harvin's another example of that. But Certainly, I think this is an example of two teams in very, very different positions. Yeah, I agree with you. I said it's a win-win. I don't like giving out this grade because the Jets' grade is fluid. That'll be when yeah. – let's see what they do in the draft. Now, you have a new GM there, so maybe he doesn't screw it up like the other GMs did with all their draft picks, and nobody's there except for Sam Darnold. And with the Jets, and you get a guy who didn't want to be – with the Jets, uh, the, the Seahawks get Adams – uh, and you, so he's your back end. He's your Russell Wilson with the defense there with Bobby Wagner. So I get it. I got the feeling that they made this move and basically said to Jamal Adams, uh, you're going to be responsible for Raheem Mostert and George Kittle. Like we're bringing yeah. you in to make sure you do damage to the San Francisco 49ers, because if we get past them, then we think we'll be the team to beat or one of the teams to beat going to the Super Bowl. And they felt like really like he was a smaller version of Cam Chancellor in a lot of different ways. Like he's more versatile than Ch Chancellor. He's the sort of presence physically that Chancellor was. And like you said, I, I think if you look at the Seahawks problems the last few years, they have related to having trouble covering tight ends. So it's George Kittle. It's Tyler Higby with the Rams. Like this has been a problem for them. And so it shores up a lot of issues for them and an on-field standpoint, but the off-field stuff I think is important too. Like I said, like I think such a big part of who they were when they were really great in the secondary was having those alphas in the secondary. And this really gives them a guy that kind of brings together that young group and may give that young group an edge. They really like Shaquille Griffin. They really like Trey Flowers. They really like Marquise Blair, the kid they drafted out of Utah a year ago. Um, they've got Quandre Diggs from the Lions, and they really feel like bringing in a guy like Adams is going to bring them that sort of edge and attitude that they had when they were winning um, at a very high level. Albert, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it, and uh, we'll continue to read. Great stuff with the MMQB. All right, thanks, Dan. Albert Breer, senior NFL reporter there for the MMQB.